Welcome to Tales from Flat Space, a podcast of science fiction and fantasy by yours truly, Gina A. Pond. Just know that the stories in this podcast may contain content that could be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. So this is a survey, part one, prologue, chapter five. Kia. There was a light breeze blowing through the garden trees, which played with her clothes and her job. She looked down and she realized she was wearing all white. The garden and the forest were lush and green, with some areas cultivated and some areas left wild. After a few moments of wandering, she heard a child singing. She followed the voice, but sometimes when she thought she was close, the child would giggle and sound far away again. Where are you? Kia called out, frustrated. She stopped in the middle of a wild patch of meadow and sat down, figuring that maybe the child would come to her. I go where I please, said a childlike voice behind her. She turned around. A small child with long, dark hair, dressed in white, was standing there with a basket of flowers. You do? Sometimes it's hard for adults to follow you when you run and hide like that, Kia said. I know. Adults never have any fun. Sometimes we do, Kia replied, remembering listening to stories at Sheila and her dog. Ooh, I like stories, the little girl said. She sat down in front of Kia. I can tell you one. You can't? She nodded and started to fiddle with the flowers in the basket, weaving stems together. There was once a child who had been through war. She lost everything, her home, her family, even her toys. That's a sad story, Kia said looking at her hands. I know, but wait, I'm not done, said the girl, but her voice had changed. Kia looked up and saw that the girl had become a teenager. The girl grew up and learned math and science. She made it to the stars, though she had to sacrifice everything. The teenager leaned over and put a flower chain bracelet on Kia's arm. Kia smiled and the girl continued to speak. When she got to the stars, she found a new family, a real family, and had many children. The voice had changed again, and now the girl was a young woman. The young woman stood and put a crown of flowers on Kia's head. The children were not only her own, but that of a whole nation, and the children adored her. She brought them wisdom and knowledge and compassion, and even though some would fall, they all remembered her lessons forever. That's a lovely story. Thank you, Kia said, as it seemed the young woman was finished. She smiled. You are the flower that will illuminate worlds, Nana. Kia blinked, and her hands looked old. But I'm no saint or god. There is no god but Allah. The young woman smiled, then brought her hands to Kia's head. No, you are not. You are a prophet, she said. And before Kia could object to being called a prophet, her mind became a whirl of memories and light. I woke up suddenly, not knowing where I was. I tried to sit up, but my body could barely move. The dream, which had disturbed me, still lingered. I'm not a prophet, I told the girl in my head. I heard giggles in the back of my mind. The rest of the dream faded away as I became more aware of my surroundings. I could hear the soft ping of equipment and the light snore of someone sleeping. Turning toward the snoring, I saw Nigel asleep in a large chair next to my bed. Why am I in a hospital? It was then the memories of confronting my uncle came back to me. That explained why I was in the hospital, but it was just a memory. There was no real pain associated with it. It was as if I were watching it like a movie of someone else's life. Did the little girl in the dream do this for me? I wondered. If she did, then it's another miracle. I tried to smile, but my face hurt. Ow, I said out loud. Nigel's eyes opened immediately, and he nearly fell out of the chair trying to untangle himself from his blanket. "'Kia, you're awake!' he said, once he managed to come to my side. "'Yes, I seem to be,' I replied. "'Where am I?' Nigel sighed with relief. "'We're in Houston, at the base hospital. They kept you sedated for several days because your... uncle gave you a severe concussion, and they were worried about the swelling causing brain damage.' They were even worried that you might have amnesia. Oh, I said. No, 
I remember everything. I wasn't sure if I wanted to tell him about the dream or not, but then decided it was too strange to explain. Plus, my mouth was dry and pain was starting to creep in. Ow, I said again. I need water. Nigel kissed my forehead. I'll go tell the nurse you're up, he said and left the room. It was another minute before a doctor and nurse came in, both female. I sighed in relief. The nurse must have seen it because she said, don't worry. Your friend was very adamant about your care when he brought you in. We've assigned all women to your care team. I'm Nikki, the day nurse. Oh, thank you very much. Hi, Kia. I'm Dr. Shopner. Let me scan you and we'll go over the things, okay? I tried to nod, but it hurt too much. So I said, yes. The doctor gave me a sympathetic smile. Don't try to move too much for now. You're practically one big bruise from head to toe. Her face showed anger briefly as she had turned on her scanner and waved in over me a few times. You were lucky, Kia. There were no major breaks and only a few hairline fractures in your jaw. We did have to take out three of your teeth, but we can replace those. You'll be on soft foods for the time being, while your mouth and the breaks heal. The scanner beeped and she looked at the readouts. Your internal injuries are doing fine. Mostly bruising and a fractured rib. The worst of the injuries was the swelling in your brain from the blows to your head. You had to perform surgery to clear up the contusion in your skull, but thankfully it wasn't as bad as we thought. You're still in the ICU for now, but we'll probably move you to a regular room in a day or two if your head behaves. The doctor turned off her scanner. It's a good thing you have at least a year before you go up to Trinity. To make sure you get certified for flight, you'll need to follow your recovery and physical therapy plan to the letter. I understand. Good. You'll be feeling a bit tired and loopy for a couple of months at least, but for now I want you to let the nurse take care of you, okay? Okay, I said. Dr. Shopner smiled. Good. I'll see you tomorrow, she said, patting my arm. I heard footsteps leave the room. Nikki came back into view. One thing the doctor forgot to say is that they had to shave your head for the surgery. Your friend Nigel brought you a stack of hijabs, though, so I've been putting them on for you. I'm afraid I'm not too good at it. The hair will grow back, and thank you for putting on the hijabs, I said. Suddenly, the demands of my body felt overwhelming. I'm thirsty and I hurt. I felt like I was whining, but Nikki just looked at me sympathetically and patted my arm gently. I have your pain medication here, then I'll raise your bed so you can have something to drink and maybe some broth. Don't try to sit up yourself, okay? Let me do all the work. There was a sound of equipment being moved and a couple of soft beeps, and then the pain started to ebb. I sighed. The nurse chuckled. That's the good stuff, huh? Yes. Oh, thank you, I said in relief. She moved to the head of the bed, and the bed started to lift me up. Nikki adjusted my body and put pillows under my arms. Then she held a cup of ice and a sponge on a stick and put the sponge to my lips. It was glorious. I sighed again, and she put the sponge to my lips a second time. Better? she asked. I nodded a little and said, yes. She adjusted the hijab for me, then said, okay, I'm going to send your friend back in. He can help you with the ice chips. But honestly, if you can convince him to leave and get some proper sleep, that would be good. He's barely been out of here since you got here. I'll try, but he's a bit of force of nature, I said, feeling able to talk better. Nikki laughed. Yes, so I hear. Let me get your dinner, okay? Tomorrow we will try getting you out of bed. Thank you, Nikki. You're welcome. I put the call button next to your hand, so if you need anything, just press it. She walked out of the room, just as Nigel came rushing in. I heard from the doctor. Thankfully, having an important position in the space program has some privileges. Are you still thirsty? I nodded slowly, and Nigel picked up the cup and stick and put some more of the ice chips to my mouth. Thank you, I said. Tell me what happened. Nigel froze. You mean when we came and got you? He didn't look at me. Yes. He put down the cup and pulled up a chair. Are you sure you want to hear this now? Yes. He took a deep breath and told me. I was distantly shocked and surprised because of the drugs. Kia, Nigel said as he rubbed his hands over his face. When I saw you just lying there, not moving, I, I wanted to kill your uncle. Jerry took care of him and your cousins. I don't know what he did, and I haven't asked. All he has said to me is that your uncle will never come after you again. Tears stung my eyes. Why? 
why do you all care about me so much? I don't know about the others, except to say that they're your friends, but... He took my hand gently, being careful of the IV needles. You're as close to me as family. Actually, closer to me than my real family. You're my sister, but more than that, I think. You're one of the few people who actually get me. I mean, I love you, you know? He stared at our hands. I guess if I'm honest, I put your project in for selfish reasons. I didn't want to go to space without you. I mean, not that I don't think your project deserves it or anything. I mean, shit, I'm saying all this wrong. Nigel wiped his eyes with his free hand. I'm sorry, I... Nigel? Yes? Shut up, I get what you mean. I said, managing as much of his grin as I could. You're my family too, I said. The only real family I've had since my uncle brought me to London. There's no blood family left that would have me. They're a loss, Nigel said. You've never told me about your family, Nigel. Why? He took another deep breath. My mom died of cancer when I was 14. My dad was a cabinet secretary and always away on business, so I took care of her. His face grew stony. He wasn't even there when she died. I haven't talked to him in years. He puts money in my account a few times a year for expenses, but these days he's always off on a yacht somewhere with some woman or other. I could feel the anger coming off him despite his lack of expression. It's why Peter Rabbit is my favorite story. My mom always read it to me when I was little, and when she got sick, I would read it to her. Oh, so that's why Peter Rabbit always makes you cry, I said. He stared at me for a moment, then nodded. I squeezed his hand as much as I could. I love you too, Nigel. You've always been a real brother to me. More than that, really. A real partner, too. He smiled. I'm glad you made me message you every night, I said, starting to feel sleepy. I told you it was worth it, he said. Hey, are you falling asleep? Yeah, I said. Go ahead and sleep, Kia. I'll protect you, he said. Tell me a story, I asked. He nodded and I closed my eyes. The story of Peter Rabbit followed me into a dreamless sleep. Chapter 6. Josh. You're not scrubbing her, Josh. But Nigel, she's just barely passing medical, I said. Launch is going to be really hard on her. Josh, if you scrub her, I'm coming down there on the next transport and walking off the project. I mean it. Nigel's tone brought me up short. She gave up everything to be on this mission, Josh. She's been disowned by all her blood family. Besides me, this is all she has left. Don't deny her this. I stared at Nigel on the screen. He'd been on Trinity for a couple of months already, working on the final assembly and calibration of the engines. We'd become good friends during training, and he had told me a lot about Kia. He was funny, very British, and usually just plain mischievous. But he was also kind and honest in his own way. I put my head in my hands and sighed. Have you even met her yet? Nigel asked. Uh, no. She's basically been over at JPL working on the flight version of the core since she got out of the hospital last year. She's been doing most of the training from there. Get on a fucking plane and meet her today. Talk to her before you do anything else, he ordered. Why? Why is it so important for her to be on Trinity, I asked. Nigel frowned. I already told you, Josh. She gave up everything to be on this mission. But besides that, I've read her work. If this works, it will jump human technology maybe a hundred or two hundred years, maybe more. He looked left to right, then said in a low voice, Listen, Captain, don't tell anyone else I told you, especially her, but she's smarter than I am. I told her once that she was the best computer scientist since von Neumann and Turing. She didn't believe me, but I was telling her the truth. My eyes widened. You're serious? But what happened to her before she got here? Why was she beat up? Nigel's face darkened in anger. I'm sorry, but it's not my story to tell without her permission. Okay, I'll go to JPL and talk to her then. You're sure she'll be okay for this? She's tougher than you can imagine, Josh. Trust me, get on the bloody plane, he said as the connection cut off. I sighed, then pushed the button on my desk. Lieutenant, I need a flight to JPL, ASAP. Yes, sir, he said. Okay, Dr. Kiyosan, let's see why Nigel is so insistent about you being on this mission, I thought, and went to go pack a bag. 
I looked through the window into the clean room. Dr. Hassan was easy to spot, as hers was the only clean room suit that was more of a hood around her head instead of a hairnet. She was in front of a large silver ball of components, talking with a group of engineers, all anonymous in their own bunny suits. One of the engineers looked up and saw me, then said something to Dr. Hassan. She narrowed her dark eyes as she came over to the comms panel. "'Can I help you, Captain Walker?' she said tersely. I pressed the button. "'I'd like to talk to you, Dr. Hassan, if that's all right. Do you have some time?' She turned to one of the other engineers, who nodded. Pushing the button on the comms panel again, she said, "'All right, Captain, I'll meet you in the conference room near the locker rooms in ten minutes.' She turned and walked towards the exit. The other engineers looked at me with varying degrees of worry and protectiveness, reminiscent of the way Nigel looked earlier that day. I tried not to react, but that surprised me. Who was this woman who could draw that kind of loyalty in only a few months, I thought. I found the conference room and waited. Dr. Hassan finally came in. She didn't hesitate. She stood right in front of me and asked, Are you scrubbing me? Oh, I, well... I saw tears well up in her eyes, but her voice was calm. Please, sir, don't take this project away from me. I've busted my arse for ten months to get ready. I know the doctors have cleared me physically to go. This is all I have left in my life, and I will see it through no matter what it takes. Her eyes bore through me into my soul, and for a moment I forgot to breathe. Her presence was a force that I could feel almost physically, which surprised me for such a tiny woman. Well, she said. My lungs seemed to work again. Uh, no... I'm not going to take it away from you. Nigel suggested I come meet you, so uh, I was going to ask you to dinner to talk about things, and you could call me Josh. She blinked. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Josh, I suppose you can call me Kia then. I don't usually stand on ceremony. Neither do I, especially when it comes to specialists. My crew, well, chain of command and all that. Oh, God, that sounded awkward, Josh, I thought to myself. Good going. She smiled, as bright as the sun coming out from behind a cloud. I won't be able to get out of here until 1800. Should I meet you at the cafeteria, then? I nodded. Yeah, sure, I said, and held out my hand. She shook it. Her hand was warm and soft, but there was something electric in her touch. Breathing became difficult again. Thank you, Josh. I'll see you later, she said, and left the conference room. I blinked and took a few deep breaths. I sat down hard on my seat. Fucking hell, I said to the room, which seemed much more empty without her in it. Nigel, you bastard, you didn't tell me she was beautiful. I found her at the cafeteria later, sitting by herself at one of the tables near the windows that looked out over the campus. I took a second to catch my breath, then made my way over to the table. She looked up when she heard me approach, and my heart skipped a beat. I cleared my throat and said, Hi, sorry I'm late. My exo called from the station to go over a few things. No worries, she said. You are the captain, after all, so I'm guessing that you're being run ragged right now, since we're so close to launch. I nodded. Oh, uh, Ian Mubarak, by the way. She grinned. Thanks. This is the first Ramadan I haven't fasted since I was a child. The doctor said it wouldn't be a good idea this close to launch, given what my body's been through in the last year. Thankfully, medical exceptions are allowed. I didn't know that, but that's pretty reasonable. How will your prayers and stuff work while you're on station? Kia shrugged. You do your best to point yourself towards Mecca, whether it's literally or in your mind. Intent is important. That makes sense. I could get our dinners if you like. It's burrito day. Her eyes lit up. Excellent. You don't have to. I stood up. No, I don't mind getting it. Uh, what do you want on yours? Chicken with everything, including hot peppers. And a sparkling water. Really? She just grinned. All right, I'll be right back. I got in line and got our food, napkins, and some silverware and brought it back. I put hers in front of her, and she reached for the hot sauce on the table. She proceeded to add a good deal of it on her burrito. I raised an eyebrow. Cholula isn't bad. Tasty, but a bit mild. Makes a lot of, of the cafeteria food here serviceable, though, she explained. I know what you mean, but I think I have something a bit better than that. I rummaged in my bag until I found the bottle, and then handed it to her. Mad Dog 357? I nodded. She shrugged and put some on her burrito and took a bite. Her eyes opened wide. Ooh, that'll do, 
she said with a smile, sucking in a breath. That's much better. I laughed. Glad you like it. I was able to get a couple of cases for the station. I don't think there will be a lot of us who will use it, but it'll be nice to have it, especially for space rations. She laughed, too, and then we ate in silence for a few minutes. How she didn't get Burrito all over her white hijab, I didn't know, but I was impressed. We started talking about random things, but as the dinner crowd filtered out, I asked, Can I ask you a personal question? Okay. What happened right before you got to Houston? Nigel said I had to ask you, as he didn't think it was right to tell me about it without your permission. She frowned. My family's from Kashmir. Oh shit, the Indian War? I asked. Kia nodded. I was six when the war broke out. My parents were killed in the first wave of bombings. My uncle came, found me, and brought me back to London, since he promised my father that he would take care of me if anything happened to them. Unfortunately, he's a fundamentalist Muslim, and his side of the family subscribed to the old views of a woman's proper place. She toyed with her napkin. But he was also conscious of his reputation in London with the Lords, so he let me go to school, then to Cambridge. I went into mathematics and computer science and came up with a design concept for the AGI. I met Nigel there. He was one of the few people who had really any faith in my ideas other than my supervisor. She paused, looking across the cafeteria. As a graduation gift, Nigel put my PhD thesis in as a mission proposal for Trinity. I wasn't sure if it would be accepted, but somehow it did. I think Nigel talked it up, but he did say he abstained from voting. Anyway, a week after they announced the flight crew, I was sent the letter that my project was accepted and funded by the Indochina bloc. I realized this was my chance to really do something important, and I wasn't going to let my uncle stop me. I'd had enough of him controlling my life, so I sent off my acceptance paperwork that afternoon, went home, packed a bag, and told my uncle that night at dinner that I was going to Houston. And he didn't like that, I said, getting angry on her behalf. She shook her head. I actually swore at him, then tried to walk out, but he had my cousins grab me and hold me while he beat me with bloody with his belt. I stared at her in shock, especially since she sounded so calm about it. It made all her medical reports make sense. I saw your medical file. He didn't just beat you, Kia. He nearly killed you, I blurted out. I know. How can you talk about this so calmly, I asked. Kia looked me straight in the eye, determined, and I felt again like she was talking straight to my soul. Josh, I won't let my uncle win. If I let the beating emotionally cripple me, then he's won. If I don't go on this mission, then I've let all the men like him win. I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing it for all the women who have been in my position. I was lucky. I had Nigel and my friends from Cambridge to come and get me. Not all of us are lucky that way. But if I can give just one woman the hope that she can break free from her abuser, then I will do it with a smile on my face no matter how much pain I'm in. She paused. Are you a Christian, Josh? I blinked, surprised at the question. Well, I was raised Methodist, but I'm not really practicing these days. Well, in Christianity, they say everyone has their cross to bear. You can think of this as mine. I nodded slowly, knowing that what Nigel had said about her was an understatement. Her face glowed with an inner fire that seemed to make her incandescent. I knew then, down to my bones, that she had to be on Trinity. Where are you with your work here? Can the engineers finish with the core before it goes up? She narrowed her eyes. Yes, most of what's left here is packing up. Why? I'm going up to Trinity in two days, and I want you on the flight, so you can come up and inspect the core room before the core comes up. We'll need to give you some more training on the EVA procedures, but you can do that when we get up there. I know from your file that launch will be painful for you, so when you get to Houston, get some meds from the flight dock. We'll see this through, Kia. The relief on her face was clear, and her smile filled the room. She took my hand in hers and said, Thank you, Josh, as if it was a blessing. She pulled her hand away and said, I should get going then, since I need to get my things together and let the engineers know. I'll see you tomorrow, then. The woman grabbed her bag and practically ran out of the cafeteria. I pulled out my tablet. You were right, Nigel. Kia and I will be up there in two days. I paused and added, You didn't tell me she was beautiful, you bastard. 
I sent the message, then cleared the remains of our dinner from the table. When I got back to my seat, the message light on my tablet was lit. I tapped to open the messages. Of course I was right, was all it said, followed by a winky face emoji. I laughed as I left the lab to take the next flight back to Houston. I had a trip to pack for. Chapter 7. Kia the spherical chamber in the center of Trinity Station seemed cavernous while I waited with Jeanette, one of my programmers. I smiled wildly, knowing that this room would soon hold my creation. Don't cry in your helmet, Kia, Jeanette teased. Oh, oh, I'm not doing that again. That was horrid. I laughed. At least when I did it in the rocket up with Josh, he took pity on me, considering my drug state. No, I want to be able to see everything. Jeanette laughed. Bridge to core chamber, came a voice over the comms. Core chamber, I replied. One minute to hatch opening, the comms officer said. Understood, I replied and nodded to Jeanette. We flattened ourselves against the wall next to the airlock and held on to the rails. The hatch on the other side of the chamber opened slowly, revealing a silver of stars that widened until we could see the engine module. Okay, that never gets old sighed Jeanette. I know, right? I agreed. The stars and even the engine were marvelous. I can't wait to tell Terrence about this, she exclaimed. We have cameras in here. Why don't you ask the comms officer if you can get some recordings or pictures, I suggested. She turned to face me, smiling. That's not a bad idea, thanks. We listened to the comms as the team moved the core from the cargo ship towards the end of the station to the hatch. It was a relief when the EVA team reported that the space bubble wrap, as Nigel called it, survived launch. Finally, the core appeared in the hatch. I felt giddy and nervous at the same time as I started to giggle. Jeanette started laughing, too. Yes, Kia, she said. It's really here. Hey, Kia, I want a sheet of that bubble wrap after you open it, said Nigel over the comms. All right, Nigel, but later, uh, a bit busy right now, I teased. Nigel laughed, but didn't say anything else. Inserting core through the hatch, said the EVA lead. I nodded to Jeanette, and we both went for the two main guy wires on either side of the chamber. Ready in the chamber, I said. Nice and easy, folks. We're not in a rush with this, said the commander of the EVA team, as the core started to enter the chamber. Shiny gold metallicized plastic covered the sphere, with eyelets protruding for the guy wires. The EVA team slowly brought the core in through the hatch. I didn't realize I was holding my breath until the core cleared the opening. I let it out as the EVA team used the maneuvering thrusters on their EMUs to make minor adjustments as they centered the AI core in the chamber. Once the EVA commander was satisfied, two of the team broke away from the core and pulled me and Jeanette to the two main eyelets. Attaching the first guy wire, I said over the comms as I carefully reached out and hooked the end of my guy wire into the core. Attaching the second, said Jeanette. We followed our wires back to the wall and turned the winches until the wires were taut. The rest of the EVA team attached the other guy wires, and finally the core was physically secure in the chamber. The commander gave me a thumbs up. Core chamber to bridge. AGI core is secure, I said proudly. Jeanette and the EVA team cheered. Good work, team. Congratulations, Dr. Hassan, said Josh. I felt my cheeks grow hot. Thank you, Captain, I said. The EVA team left through the hatch, and the core light switched on as the hatch closed. Returning to airlock, I reported, as we made our way back to where we had started. While we waited for the hour for the airlock to pressurize, I stared at the wrapped core, smiling from ear to ear. Alu Akbar, I thought. Thank you, Allah, for this magnificent lifeboat. Three, two, Welcome to North India Today. We are joined live this morning by Dr. Kia San from Trinity Station, which will soon leave orbit on its historic journey to the Oort cloud for 10 years of scientific research. Dr. Hassan's experiment in artificial intelligence is said to be possibly one of the biggest achievements in computing since the invention of the computer. Dr. Hassan, welcome to North India Today. Thank you. Glad to be here, I said, feeling a little nervous. Nigel gave me a thumbs up. Josh just stood out of sight with his arms crossed. We are also joined by Dr. Rakesh Pandey from the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. Welcome, Dr. Pandey. Thank you, the man said. I looked at Nigel, who shrugged, but looked wary. Who's this? It was just supposed to be me in the interview, I thought. 
The host began by asking several general questions about Trinity in my research. Then he asked, Dr. Hassan, how will your work on artificial intelligence benefit the Indian Confederation? I took a breath before replying. I see the development of AGIs as a benefit to all humanity. I believe they can help us move our technology forward faster than humans alone can. But also, to create a mind that is capable of human-like thought would be an incredible achievement. The other scientist grunted loudly, then bellowed. Your work is fanciful at best and a joke at worst, Mrs. Hassan. A complete waste of time and money by the Indochina bloc. The physics in the Oort cloud will be no different than the physics here on Earth. Weren't there any real engineers and scientists that could have been sent on this mission instead of this woman who should be at home raising her children? The host frowned and said, Dr. Penday, please. I felt my eyes widen as then the screen went blank. Nigel snarled sarcastically. Oops, sorry, Captain, I must have accidentally hit the off button. Josh looked annoyed at Nigel, but nodded to the ensign operating the comms unit, who relaxed. Get me Houston, said Josh with a stony face. Houston to Trinity Station, what happened to the feed? Dr. Evans accidentally hit the off switch, Houston, Josh deadpanned. Why weren't we informed of this Dr. Penday's presence on this show? They said it would be an interview with Dr. Hassan alone. The last thing we need is our people being harassed by idiotic pseudo-academics who know nothing about the science being conducted on the station. It's bad enough being stuck with the political officers. One moment, Trinity, said the Houston comms officer. After a minute, the screen flared to life again, and Admiral Hansen, Josh's superior, came on the screen. Josh saluted. Admiral! At ease, Josh, he said with a grin. Sorry about that interview. Apparently one of the Indian ministers got a bug up his ass about a woman scientist being interviewed and demanded that a male scientist who works in the field be on the, at the last minute. I can't guarantee that it won't happen again, though. Then don't take interviews from those bloody imbeciles, grumbled Nigel. Josh raised his eyebrows, but didn't say anything. The Admiral sighed. Dr. Evans, you know as well as I do what the political situation is. The Indochina bloc is the primary funder of Trinity, and diplomatic relations with them are actually somewhat calm at the moment. We can't just ignore them. I will reiterate to their PR people that they need to stick to the script. That's the best I can do. Sir, said the comms officer. Josh nodded for them to speak. We could ask for only pre-recorded questions, then record scripted pieces here. We'll have to do that once we're in position in the York Cloud anyway. We can't really control what they do during editing, but it'll certainly keep us from being blindsided again, they suggested. The Admiral looked thoughtful for a moment. That's a good idea, Ensign. I'll strongly suggest that to the PR team. Good thinking. Right, I'll leave you to the rest of the interviews, he said. The screen went dark. Josh sighed, then said, Thank you, Ensign. Good call. The Ensign smiled. I used to work in media, sir. Then they winked at me. I smiled back and got out of the way of the camera in preparation for Josh's interview. Nigel came over to stand next to me. They all love Josh in North America, he stage whispered to me. All American good old boy goes to the stars. I put my hand over my mouth, trying not to laugh. Josh glared at Nigel, and Nigel smiled sweetly back. I had to turn around for a moment. The screen switched over to Mission Control. Five minutes until good morning, North America, Mission Control said. Thank you, Houston, Josh replied with a sigh. A blonde woman was now on the screen, sitting on a stool in front of the NASA logo, putting an earpiece to her ear. Trinity, this is Houston. Are you ready for the interview? Houston, this is Trinity. We're ready. Stand by for sound check. The blonde woman stopped fiddling with her earpiece, then looked at the camera and said, Hello, Trinity Station. This is Gloria Jennings. Can you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you just fine. Welcome on board Trinity Station, Josh said, his voice warm and practiced. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My nephew was so excited about me interviewing you today, he wants to be an astronaut when he grows up. Josh smiled. Well, you tell him that Captain Walker looks forward to seeing him in space one day. You're right, Nigel. He really is good at this, I whispered. You should see him with kids, Nigel whispered back, giving me a significant look. I blushed. Are we starting, Bill? She stared at someone behind the camera, then adjusted her notes. Three, two, said a voice off screen. Good morning from Houston, Texas. We are, we are here at the historic Johnson Space Center during the last few days before Trinity Station leaves orbit for the Oort Cloud at the edge of our solar system. 
We are talking to Captain Josh Walker, the mission commander and Midwest native. Thank you for being with us today, Captain Walker. How excited are you to be commander of this unprecedented mission? Josh held up the microphone. Ms. Jennings, I was honored to be named commander of this mission three years ago, and it is a thrill to be finally living on Trinity Station full time. This will be such a massive step forward for humanity, not just because of the amazing science that will be conducted on the station, but because of the cooperation of so many countries in making it happen. It is definitely unprecedented. What it's, what's it like training for a mission of this scope? Josh thought for a moment, then said, Well, I've been training all my life to be an astronaut. I mean, I was watching the classics like Star Trek and Star Wars as a kid, but when I got older, I got really into flying planes. I ended up joining the Air Force as a test pilot, but getting into astronaut training was a dream come true. It's not easy by any means, but I... A loud boom sounded off screen from Houston. Then the screen went blank. Trinity Station, stand by, said the comms officer at Mission Control. The hell? said Josh. Ensign, bring up the news feeds. Yes, sir. The bridge was tense as the comms officer worked rapidly, finally bringing up the news feed from the satellites. The announcer for North American News Network was on the screen. We'll come back to glory in a moment, but we're getting reports of bombings at other Trinity mission sites around the globe. He glanced down at his tablet. Yes, the main logistics center and Indochina Space Agency launch center in China is also reporting an, an attack. Reports are coming in from the UN in Geneva of a bombing there as well, and another at Kennedy Space Center and JPL in California. We're not sure who is responsible yet, and so far no one's claimed responsibility. He paused, listening to someone on his headset. What? Really? It seems our camera person in the Houston was recording footage outside at the time of the incident and has a video of possible suspects just before they set off the explosive. Ted, show it. The view changed to drone footage showing seven white men in dark business suits getting out of a van and approaching the Houston Space Center main building. They walked in two lines of three with a seventh man in the lead holding a small box. As they approached the building and entered the lobby, they started to sing, Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. Ten seconds later, an explosion blew out all the building's front windows. We watched in stunned silence. Fucking hell, the XO Mary said, breaking the silence. The feed returned to the news anchor. It appears a group calling themselves the Owenites are claiming responsibility for the bombings. Play it. The screen switched to a video where an older white man in a dark suit was staring into the camera. I am Father Owen. My brethren have nobly sacrificed themselves today in the name of God and decency. We are demanding that Trinity Station be stopped, as humans were not meant to be in space, creating artificial life forms and abominations of genetic engineering. We regret the harm to the innocent today. However, humanity has lost its way in order to... Shit! Cut the feed! Now! XO, unseal the checklist for contingency 16, Josh ordered. Yes, sir, Mary snapped, already reaching for her tablet. The bridge was suddenly silent. Chapter 8, Josh Mary opened a small cabinet near her station. She pulled out a bright yellow file, sealed with red and white striped tape. The bridge crew began to mumble to each other, uncertain about what was happening. When I looked around at my confused crew, it made me furious that we had to start the mission like this. I shoved my anchor to the back of my mind, trying to focus on what needed to be done. All right, folks, this is a need-to-know contingency plan, and now you all need to know. I know none of you have trained explicitly for this, but just do your jobs and we'll get through fine. XO, start the checklist. Mary opened the file and began to read in a measured tone. 1. Terminate all bridge to ground comms. Comms already disabled, reported the comms officer. Confirmed, responded Mary. 2. Disconnect breakers 147A, 147B, 147C, 23A, and 23B. One of the other bridge crew com complied. I'll need your authorization, sirs, they said. Mary and I pressed the palm plates at our stations. Authorization confirmed, I said. Confirm voice, digital, and telemetry comms termination. Confirm, Captain. All telemetry drink links down, Mary reported. Link layer confirmed down. Protocol layer showing red. Data and voice comms termination confirmed, sir, the comms officer confirmed. All right, folks. We're now disconnected from the ground. Give me security, I said. Daiichi, the security head answered. Commander, we are implementing contingency plan 16. 
We have already shut down communications. Open your packet and follow instructions, please. Also, post guards around all critical subsystems and access panels. No access without confirmation from myself, the XO, or the chief engineer. Understood. Mobilizing team. Thanks, Taiichi. Keep me apprised. Yes, sir, he said, as the comms officer closed the channel. Mary, get all the other department heads up here immediately. No one else is allowed on the bridge. I finally took a moment to breathe as I looked at Kia and Nigel. Nigel was muttering, bloody fascist. Kia was gazing me with a strangely serene expression, tinged with a little worry. I wondered briefly how she could be so calm about this. Finally, the department heads arrived. As the last of them filed in, I heard shouting outside the bridge doors. I went to look and found Zhang, the Indo-China political officer, being held by one of the security officers. Figures it's this asshole, I thought. Zhang was the worst of the political officers. He and his aide hadn't endeared themselves to the crew at all, and had constantly complained about everything from their quarters to the food. I had a feeling he was harassing some of the Indo-China block staff, too. Captain Walker, I demand to know what's going on. We lost all comms. That is unacceptable. I need to be able to contact my government at all times. Yes, I know the comms are down, Zhang. I was the one who turned them off. I'll brief all the political officers once we've secured the station. Until then, security, take him to his quarters and lock him in. If he comes out of his quarters again, throw him in the brig. Yes, sir, said the security officer with a grin as I returned to my station. Mary closed the door to the bridge. I took a deep breath and turned to the department heads. Folks, I've initiated Contingency 16. I know you don't know what that is, but so I'll give you the short version. Multiple Trinity sites on Earth, including Mission Control, have been bombed, and the news reported that it was an act of a terrorist organization. So right now, we're acting under orders to ensure that we stay in one piece and alive. We've cut all comms with the ground to ensure that the terrorists can't remotely trigger anything. Our orders at the moment are to assume that someone on board has sabotaged Trinity until proven otherwise. Security will be inspecting all the critical areas, but I need all of you to go through your own areas with a fine-tooth comb. The XO is acting incident commander. Report to her anything that looks out of place. Do not move anything that you find until we can determine what it is. All computing staff, military and civilian, will begin a security audit of all computer systems and report to Dr. Hassan, who will coordinate from here. I turned to one of the other officers. Guidance, navigation, and control. I need you to compute some options for immediate Earth departure and stack rank them. I'd like options in 10 minutes. Detail someone to get on the collision avoidance radar system and set it to maximum. I want to know if someone or something from Earth even blinks at us. Lieutenant nodded. Yes, sir. I turned to Nigel. Nigel, we need the engines prepped and ready to burn. How long do you need? Nigel thought for a moment. We're nearly there. We just need to run the pre-burn checklist, so maybe 20 minutes? Assuming nothing goes boom for for then. What's their relative priority in comparison to looking for bombs? Put as many people as you can on the search. Run the checklist yourself while they're waiting. I know the search will probably take longer, but be aware that we might need to hit the go button sooner rather than later. Right, got it. He nodded. Okay, people, let's get this done, I said, dismissing them. Nigel left quickly, and most of the other department heads followed. Only Kia, according to the software audit from the tech console, remained. I paced around the bridge, watching my crew work. Eventually, the XO approached me. Sir, she said in a low tone, you're looming. Sit at your station or go to your office. I took a deep breath. I knew there was a reason I picked you for my XO. She gave me a small smile and returned to her station. I sat down as instructed and waited. Bridge, this is engineering, called Nigel about ten minutes later. We've got something on one of the reaction mass pods, sending the drone footage. On screen, I said. The screen lit up with a view of the rear of the station, where there were rows of tanks attached to an inner grid with a pipe down the center. The drone focused on one of the tanks, which appeared to have an odd lump on the outside near one of the support struts. Nigel, what the hell is that? The view centered and zoomed in, showing a plastic box that looked glued to the outside of the tank. I'm not sure yet, but it's certainly something that should not be anywhere near my engines. Can you send an EVA drone out to look at it? Stand by, Nigel said. A couple of minutes later, Nigel was back. We can do better than that. We have an industrial radiography kit here that we use for finding cracks in metal. We're strapping the emitter to one drone and the image imager plate to the other. I'd rather get a look at its innards before we poke at it. I nodded. Good plan, Nigel. Get it done. Set up the feet up here. Leave your comms open. 
I listened to the comm chatter from engineering for another five minutes until the feed from the inspection drone picked up the two X-ray drones positioning themselves on either side of the box. Okay, Owens, dialed the dose down as far as it'll go, Nigel said. This only looks like a plastic box on the outside, and I don't want to risk glitching any electronics. Right, boss. The screen shifted, showing an X-ray cross-section of the box. There are several cylinders inside and a small circuit board with a battery. Any sign of an antenna, Nigel? I asked. Not so far as we can tell, Captain. If it has one, it's probably integrated into the circuit board and not sensitive enough to pick up a signal from Earth. Doesn't mean it couldn't pick up something from engineering. I wouldn't, it wouldn't pick up anything from the hab ring, though, since there's no line of sight. I tap my console. Security post guards on all accesses leading to engineering and do a sweep to make sure everyone is where they are supposed to be. Sorry to have to send the soldiers into your kingdom, Nige. It's all for a good cause. Just don't think you can do it all the time. I wouldn't dream of it. Nigel was quiet for a moment, then said, We have some more images now, so we can do a 3D model. It's not perfect, but it'll do. The view on the screen shifted to a slowly rotating glass-like view of the device. Is that a risk comm? I asked. Yeah, that's what we think too, so it's definitely got an antenna, but it's also got an accelerometer. Nigel paused again. Shit, I'm guessing that it's supposed to go off when we throttle up. If someone was going to set it off from inside the station, we'd be dead already. How do we get rid of it, Nigel? Well, the good news is that it looks like whoever did it was in a hurry. It's just glued in place. Given the size, it was probably brought up by one of the assembly crew in a pocket of his EVA suit, then slapped it on with a sticky pad when no one else was looking. Give us a few minutes, Captain. We'll sort something out. Right, I said. Anson, get me security again. Yes, sir, he said. Daiichi here, Captain. Nigel sent me the footage. We've already analyzed the video archive and found our suspect. Good work. Please tell me they're not on board. Nope, they're on Assembly Mission 94, which left three weeks ago. Name's Donald Rhodes. On a hunch, I ran facial recognition and gait analysis on all the bombing footage we had from the news feeds, thinking he might be one of these assholes, and guess what? An image popped up on the screen with one of the men circled on it from the Houston bombing. Son of a bitch, your hunch was right! I exclaimed. Well, at least he's back on Earth, and I don't have to throw him out an airlock. Save that to send to Earth later. Sir, someone interrupted Daiichi on his end. One of my teams just caught someone trying to physically access the comms downlink breaker panel in the core. Having a good idea just who it was, I said, Daiichi, just throw them in the brig. I'll deal with them later. It's the Indochina's PO's aide, sir. He's already squealing like a stuck pig, Daiichi said. I figured as much. Put him in the brig, sergeant, as ordered, and make sure you record everything. Yes, sir. Engineering to bridge. We're sending out another drone with a tool we just made. Switching to drone footage. I stared at the drone. Other folks on the bridge hid their giggles. Nigel, is that a spatula from the galley on the end of the drone? Good work, Captain. You want a job on my team? The bridge crew studiously paid attention to their readouts. The idea is we'll insert it under the box and gently lever it up to break adhesion. Since they just use a sticky pad and those aren't made for vacuum, it should come right up. Not very bright, these folks. Anyway, then we'll try very, very, very carefully to move it to a safe distance. We covered the tool with a vacuum compliant glue so it won't go drifting away. This was all happening on screen as Nigel narrated. The box did indeed come right off and stick to the spatula. The drone slowly backed away. Uh, Nigel, do you need that drone? How far can you get it away from the station? There was a pause. Uh, I see what you're getting at. Well, there's enough reaction mass on the drone at minimum thrust for about 15 minutes. I used one of the small drones powered by cold gas thrusters, not one of the big ones with ion drives, just in case the EMI from an ion drive would trigger it. Thoughtful of you, Nigel. Get it as far as you can, then, with the last of the fuel, throttle up gradually. I want to know what acceleration was going to trigger it. Right, 14 minutes, Captain, Nigel said. The cameras followed the drone as it moved away from the station. I waited, thinking all the gods that there were that we had found this thing. Others on the bridge were working at their consoles or watching the drone footage. Finally, Nigel said, Okay, go for throttle up, Owens. In less than a minute, there was a small but bright flash. I let out a breath that I hadn't realized I'd been holding. 
Fucking hell, it popped at point eight G. That was way too bloody close, Nigel yelled. Good work, engineering team. Nigel, come back up here. On my way. I turned to the XO. Mary, get the rest of the department heads up here. I walked over to where Kia was intently working in her console. Anything? I asked. She shook her head. Nothing, but I suggest we run on safe mode with everything non-critical disabled while my team does a more thorough audit. I patted her on the shoulder. Okay, carry on while I hear from the others. She nodded. The heads of the department came filing back in. Report, I ordered. Lizanne went first. We found nothing in the hab ring. Nothing inside engineering, Nigel reported. Nothing else on the exterior, either, aside from the one we already disposed of. Nothing in medbase, sir, or the biology labs, reported the CMO. Aside from the idiot aide and the POs ready to tear down their doors, we haven't found anything else, sir, said the security chief. GNC, when's our next escape window? Twenty hours, sir, they said. Nigel, have the engines ready to go by then. The rest of you secure your stations for burn. Comms monitor the 400 megahertz band, analog only, no digital modes for any contacts. The sheriff's folks will probably be mobilized and trying to get an update from us. I looked at each of them in turn. Good work, people. Now I get to explain things to the POs. Everyone gave me a look of sympathy. Nigel just said, better you than me, mate. They all left the bridge. Sir, I'm picking up a signal, said the comms officer. Let's hear it. Trinity Station, this is NN3546, NASA Ames. Please respond. I nodded to the ensign. Open, sir. NASA Ames, this is Trinity Station. What's the situation? Oh, thank goodness. We hope that one of us would be able to reach you. Sir, there have been bombings at nearly all of the Trinity sites. Yes, we heard about that before we turned off our primary comms. Why'd you do that? I asked, bewildered. I looked at Mary, who covered her mouth, trying not to laugh. We're following Contingency Plan 16. I don't know what that is, sir. I looked up the ceiling and took a breath. I suggest you contact Admiral Hansen at Johnson Space Center and have him read you in. Send him the message that we're following Contingency Plan 16 that will send a digital packet once we're past Mars. Otherwise, we'll be radio silent. Do you have that, Ames? The radio operator repeated. Tell Admiral Hansen at Johnson that you're following Contingency Plan 16 and that you'll send a digital packet once you've gone past Mars. You'll be radio silent until then. I sighed. That's correct, Ames. Good luck down there. Thanks, sir. You too. Godspeed, Trinity. Ames clear. Mary came over to me and said, Not the most suspicious send-off, sir. No, it's not, but for better or worse, we're on our way, I said. You have been listening to Tales from Flat Space. If you want to support me in my writing, there are many ways to do it. Share this podcast, follow me on my Twitch channel, or buy my books. All you have to do is go to RevGenaPond.net and click on the relevant links. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.